Wow, what a beauty. By golly, I think I'll buy a new car. In mid-20th century America, nothing defined progress in the post-war boom quite like the automobile. A perfect mesh of form and function, benefiting from all the new technologies the world had to offer. From self-starters, front-wheel drive, the automatic transmission, comfort and convenience was king and anything seemed possible. For car manufacturers, it was a time of prosperity, but there was always the chance of falling into obsolescence. To stay on top, you needed to be ahead of the competition, become the first to find the next big thing. And that next big thing, it was jet cars. Okay, so not exactly jet cars, not like you might think of them. These didn't fly, flames weren't bursting from the exhaust, but beyond those surface level details, they were jet cars. The gas turbine engine was the most promising successor to the standard, piston-driven machines the world had seen to that point. And the story of these vehicles is one of optimism, tragedy, and some of the most outlandish examples of retro-futurism I have ever seen. Gas turbine engines were not entirely new by the 1950s. After years of trial and error, they had allowed the first fighter jets to fly by the end of the war. The potential benefits of using this engine in a car would make it a worthwhile effort. It ran smoother than a standard piston engine. It didn't need coolant, the flowing air could provide that itself. They weighed less and still produced a lot of power. There were less moving parts that could go wrong, meaning more reliability and the engines could last longer. You could take anything that burned oxygen, whether it be gasoline, diesel, kerosene, perfume, tequila, or hairspray, and it would run. But most importantly, it sounded absolutely incredible. It shouldn't be too much of a surprise that the manufacturers working with and developing the engines during the war would be the first to attempt to fit them into a car. A great event at Silverstone, North Hans, when the world's first gas turbine car was given its demonstration run. Produced by the world-famous Rover Car Company and driven by Mr. Morris Wilkes, the chief engineer, it was obviously the focus of tremendous interest for the newsreels and press. Companies like Rover, Fiat, and Renault were some of the first to try this out, but many of these tests would be just that, tests. Proofs of concept, often hindered by massive technical hurdles and logistics problems. Most of these experiments wouldn't amount to much, other than the publicity briefly boosting sales for other cars from the manufacturers but some took it a bit further than others. Chrysler's research division, led by George Huebner Jr., was one of the biggest supporters of this jet car future. March 25th, 1954, an important date in the automobile industry. Chrysler Corporation announced the development and successful road testing of the first American-built gas turbine engine in a production line automobile. This wasn't some fancy concept car, a one-off. It was a car that you could buy today. Chrysler paraded its reliability, lack of cooling requirements, and its amazing sound. And also, yeah, it could consume all kinds of fuel, not restricted to standard gasoline or diesel. While today that might seem like a major selling point, the biggest selling point, in the early 50s it was a mere novelty. A bonus with no real practical use. Gas was cheap. 29 cents on average, a mere $2 even adjusted for inflation. There was no indication that it would ever rise in price, but even still, the public was hooked. And while Chrysler made headlines, growing the hype with its real-world showcase, it wasn't the only head-turner this year by an American manufacturer. When people got a good look at the one and only Firebird at General Motors Motorama, they left no doubt that Americans confidently expect this country's industrial and engineering genius to come up with tomorrow's best as it has today. The Firebird by GM was a concept car in its purest form. It was revolutionary, gorgeous, and unrealistic by any standard. It was just a jet, a jet you could drive. The unnecessary tail fin coupled with actual unusable wings and an exhaust that looked like it was about to spew out flames. That's not to say it was actually that fast. Sure, it could get going if it wanted to, but it would be slower than the top performing cars of the day. As she runs up the miles on proving ground roadways, engineers will try to find how best to stop her, with or without her brake flaps. Try to make her run quieter, use less fuel, 
They'll try to make her more responsive to her throttle, thoroughly safe, easy to service. To solve these and other problems, they'll have to find the answers to a thousand and one questions. It might just seem a bit shallow, a weird car with no promise of production, but GM wasn't just in this as a publicity stunt. Built off the same engine, it would reveal its turbo cruiser bus, a slightly more practical form for a turbine vehicle. The turbine engine could provide the torque and horsepower needed for massive trucks, and it didn't hurt that the Federal Aid Highway Act was being passed around the same time. Manufacturers had newfound interest in the potential of larger shipping vehicles, and these could be the largest. But it came at a cost. In the early days of turbine engines, there was a lot of smoke and mirrors presented to the public. Some of these cars would work, but briefly. There was no guarantee you could start it up when you needed to show the press, and most were only ever displayed in films or short test runs. These early turbines were more than just inefficient, they were impractical. Standard cars during this time could reach 3 to 6,000 RPMs, but turbines, they could go a lot higher, 100,000 RPMs. But that was too much, that number would be scaled back to a still unreasonable 60,000 RPMs. Reduction gears would bring that down to a more usable level, but it would eat fuel regardless. It wouldn't matter if you floored it or were idling the engine, you were looking at single digit miles per gallon. In the heat generated, that was a whole other issue. Without modifications, these early turbine engines would produce exhaust that could literally melt your face off, or the bumper of a vehicle behind you. And for all these drawbacks, these vehicles still couldn't accelerate that quickly. Unless you launched from a start holding the brake to get ideal RPMs, there was going to be a lot of lag in just getting the car to go faster. Many of these problems were technical hurdles that could be figured out, but there was financial issues as well. These engines needed rare metals to make, would require new factories for mass production, and even with the lowest estimates would still cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, adjusted for inflation, to sell to the public. But that was a given with any new technology. Not all turbine cars garnered the same hype or promise. Around this time, Ford was taking small engines from Boeing and just shoving them in existing car models. Selling the future was easy, and few companies did this better or worse, depending on your perspective, than GM. A milestone in automotive engineering is marked by the completion of General Motors' Firebird II, the first gas turbine family car ever built and tested in the United States. The Firebird project continued with the Firebird II, shown off at Motorama 1956 with the wonderful promotional film Key to the Future. your high compression we're gonna be late after the family breaks out into song they are transported 20 years into the distant future 1976 we get to see some rare footage of the firebird 2 actually driving it still looks like a jet but crossed with the standard sedan and here we have more future predictions for the 70s hello tower this is firebird 2 304. Firebird 2, 304. How are things on the safety autoway? Tower to Firebird 2. Tower to Firebird 2. Traffic controllers, like air traffic controllers, but for cars. They'll show you how to get to different locations, lay out maps, and communicate with the family through some in-vehicle audio system. You have your choice of two routes. Green line marks scenic route. Red line, shorter route. We're on vacation. Who wants to fly? All the instruments laid out on the dashboard in this simplified format. You can change it at will. It's very similar to what we have today. One of the biggest features of the Firebird 2, and all of the concepts that would succeed it, was that it could drive itself. Now, it wasn't done through the means you'd expect today with cameras and AI, but instead with electronic sensors that would read strips laid onto the road itself. Ah, oh, this is the life. 
Safe, cool, comfortable. Mind if I smoke a cigar? Oh, not with this wonderful air conditioning. For some reason, a large trend in the 1950s and 60s car concepts was beverage dispensers. Hey, do you want some ice cream or a cool drink? Orange juice, please. Oh, me too. I'm gonna go for the ice cream. A quick side note, I love the depiction of the 70s future here. It's no Logan's Run, if anything it's closer to Westworld, but the bizarre map paintings, traffic centers, elevated highways, and that desert look all great. Near the end we see the Firebird steering wheel, or lack of steering wheel. This was another trend during the 50s and 60s. We end with another lengthy musical number. Okay Firebird, I'll put you on the beat. The sunset ends a honey, and the hostess is a dream. This time showing off the video call system of the Firebird 2, which allows the family to book a hotel in song. Okay, okay, we like what you say. Mr. Tower Man, take us that way. The Firebird 2's more fantastical features, like self-driving, were for show, but that didn't mean the turbine engine itself was stagnant. Using regenerative systems, heat produced could be reused in the engine itself, allowing for both better mileage and cooler exhaust temperatures. Not to leave the buses behind, GM would also show off the Turbo Cruiser 2. The problems of the turbine engine certainly weren't solved, but from the public's eye, things were moving in the right direction. Chrysler was a bit more ambitious around this time, planning a cross-country tour in a turbine-powered vehicle. Part essential testing, part publicity stunts, it would demonstrate to the public how far they had come. And it succeeded in both its goals. Wherever it went, people followed. People wanted to see this vehicle, and while it wasn't ready for mass production, it was a big step that showed these things could exist beyond car show novelties. But I still love the novelties. It's the story of the General Motors research, styling, and engineering staffs working together as a team at the vast General Motors Technical Center. Here, in an atmosphere conducive to search and discovery, GM men of ideas work for a better tomorrow. The Firebird 3 is one of the strangest concepts I've ever seen. The two bubbles on top that separate the passengers, it's impractical and looks cool for the sake of looking cool at the expense of everything else. Rather than a traditional steering wheel, it would have this unintuitive joystick control. Acceleration, braking, steering, all managed by this one stick. The self-driving features of the previous Firebird are still here, and still rely on roads that do not exist. The regenerative tech of the turbine engines was making more progress. The once abysmal acceleration lag was now just not great acceleration lag. And with even cooler exhaust, it wasn't setting the grass on fire. What really sells the concept is that styling, though. Even in the grand scheme of concept vehicles, it's so far out there. But it helped to continue the hype train, that these vehicles, now being shown off regularly, were coming to the market soon. And Chrysler had good incentive to make that happen. Around this time, Chrysler was starting to see a fall in its market share. Financially, the company was in for rough times, for reasons related to reliability of their cars, corporate decisions, and this turbine car, it could be the saving grace. But the engines weren't ready for public use, not yet. And at least for right now, they'd lean into GM's strategy, making a fantastic looking vehicle that would obviously never be mass produced. This is the Turbo Flight, and I only mention it because I think it looks great. As a show car, again, it wasn't an indication of what would ever hit the market, but what cars could look like in a new jet-powered age, without looking like actual jet fighters. This was in the midst of the Space Age, the Jetsons, the future looks bright, and if there was a perfect time to start mass-producing that turbine engine, it was soon. The culmination of this sustained and dedicated effort was the announcement to the news media in February 1962 by Robert Anderson, Vice President, Product Planning, Chrysler Corporation, that the corporation planned to build 50 turbine-powered passenger cars for release to selected users. The Chrysler Turbine Car, an entirely new model created solely to house the newest generation of turbine engine, designed by coach builder Ghia and sent out to the general public. Yes, by contacting Chrysler, you could apply to win one of these vehicles for personal use for a limited time. Your very own jet-powered car. 
50 were made, sent out to 203 individuals, with five additional models made for prototyping within Chrysler. It would be an understatement to call this just a success. Every time somebody would receive a vehicle, there would be a media circus. Chrysler took great advantage of this, ensuring that each giveaway went smoothly. For the drivers, it was like winning the lottery, and would, at least for the next few months, make you a local celebrity. Everybody wanted to see, to ride, to drive the jet car. At the same time, it eased some of the public's concerns with the technology. People could see that this car wasn't setting things on fire behind the exhaust. The noise was distinct, but not particularly loud. It wasn't bursting eardrums as it drove to the supermarket. Not everything went without a hitch. Technical issues persisted, often due to user error. This isn't to say that even in ideal situations, they were the most reliable vehicles. And if problems did occur, repairing the engine would be far more difficult than any other machine on the road. The engine was new and untested, and you simply couldn't take it to the local mechanic for repair. And the bodies, they were handcrafted, meaning no interchangeable parts. While you could put any fuel inside this, it had very specific preferences on the matter. The most popular fuel in America, leaded gasoline, could harm the engine with lead residue. Instead, it preferred diesel or kerosene. But for any of the drawbacks, it couldn't slow down the hype of this car and the technology powering it. It was everywhere. Movies, magazines, it became an icon in its own right. And as these cars were taken back by Chrysler, the program ended, the public anxiously waited for the day that they could buy their very own at a dealership. But behind the scenes, things weren't so optimistic. Chrysler's turbine car experiment went flawlessly in the eyes of the public, but actually making them was quite a financial investment. Since everyday average people were driving these things, the expectation was that they were relatively inexpensive, that they could go on sale within a year or so, but they were anything but cheap. Combined with the custom body and the turbine engine, on the market, these cars would have to sell for upwards of $250,000 to make a profit, adjusted for inflation. Even with all the advancements of turbine engines, they just weren't getting any cheaper. At best, the price could drop to 150 grand or so if these were mass-produced, but that wasn't looking too likely at all. To build the new factories to mass-produce turbine cars, it could cost Chrysler a billion dollars in 1950s money. And given the current state of the company, they wouldn't have seen profits for decades. There was still hope that some new advancement could make this all cheaper. In the meantime, it was important to keep this in the public consciousness. The World Fair of 1964, while Chrysler had a lot of attention with its ongoing public testing, other manufacturers jumped at the chance to show off their own turbine projects. GM's exhibits were, again, bizarre. Now are bringing to the innermost depths of the tropic world the goods and materials of progress and prosperity, creating productive communities that can enter profitably the markets of the world. The Firebird 4. It was here, but not operational. The biggest difference besides its new look was a new take on the non-functioning self-driving feature. Using programmable cards, you could input a location to a computer, which the car would find its way to using the electronic roads that didn't yet exist. Another concept was the large futuristic truck called the Bison. Not too much is known about this vehicle, other than it likely couldn't run at all. Instead, it probably existed just to promote GM's new standard shipping containers. All of this was overshadowed by a surprise. Ford had returned with something actually great. What will tomorrow's trucks be like? Well, meet Big Red. Yes, one of the most famous turbine automobiles with a long and detailed history all its own. And unlike the bison, it worked. This thing would travel across the United States, bringing joy and excitement wherever it went. Not just because it was a jet truck, but because it was also big and red. It was so big, you needed to use a retractable ladder to get inside it. Inside, you'd find accommodations you'd normally expect from an RV. A sink, a fridge, a toilet, an oven, even a TV. Not to mention the same beverage dispensers as the Firebird 2. The console was freestanding, with wide windows that gave you a huge view. For truckers, it was the dream vehicle, and for everybody else, it was big, red, and beautiful. GM would respond with its own turbine-powered big rig, the Turbo Titan III. Don't worry about the first two. If I'm being honest, it was a slightly more realistic big rig than the Big Red. 
It had less power outputs, was far smaller, and standard accommodations. The weirdest part about it was the steering wheel, or whatever this was supposed to be. The turbine vehicle was no longer just a futurist concept created to get manufacturers noticed. It was very much on the horizon with more players getting involved, which made its downfall all the more tragic. Chrysler's financial problems were not getting any better. The Chrysler turbine car program had been a success, but it was never going to go on forever. In a very controversial move, the company destroyed 46 of the 55 turbine cars. The reasons behind this are also controversial. Some accuse Chrysler of avoiding tariffs due to shipping these from Ghia, but it's far more likely that it was because they were concept cars, and Chrysler didn't want these getting into the public's or competition's hands. Standard practice, but tragic nonetheless. The price to develop these engines were still too high. Eventually, with enough time, with enough money, this could have been solved, but there was a far greater issue on the horizon that would change the car industry forever. Over the course of the 20th century, smog was a fairly well-known issue. Federal regulation began to restrict car emissions around this time, but those restrictions targeted piston engines and what those could possibly achieve. Turbine engines were not good with emissions. When burning gas, the engines were nowhere close to even reaching the basic federal standards. To solve this issue, you would have to take a hit from gas consumption. While these cars could potentially get 19 miles per gallon, that efficiency would need to be sacrificed for the sake of emissions. And then... The oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. They will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. If the Arab countries keep that pledge, it would reduce their production by almost 50% in one year. The oil crisis. Suddenly, there was regulations on not just emissions, but mileage. People wanted cars that burned less fuel, right now. Research and development costs were better suited to getting those piston engines to perform with more efficiency and less emissions. And even if the turbine engine could burn other fuels that weren't gasoline, the emission standards were based on gasoline because it was still the most common fuel source. The EPA would grant Chrysler funds for research to continue studying whether this turbine could meet all regulations, but it never really seemed that feasible. As new advancements would be made, new regulations would be put in place, it was a battle that would never be won. Chrysler Corporation takes its position in support of the Dingle Boyle numbers. Moreover, from a practical standpoint, we've just about run out of time for 1979. Accordingly, we believe the first order of business is for Congress to carry over the 1977 emission standards through the 1978 and 1979 model years. You are here telling me now that you have already conducted tests with V8 engines which meet the test of, of the statutory standards. Now, how can you ask me for five more years under those circumstances? We're not talking about our technical ability to meet the standards one way or another. What we are talking about is that meeting the standards involves a number of trade-offs that should be considered. What we've got to do is to say, how do we clean up the air at the lowest possible cost? And until you gentlemen look at that overall problem that way, I'm afraid you're coming up with a lot of wrong answers. It's estimated that by the end, the cost of a fuel-efficient, emissions-certified, mass-produced turbine car could cost upwards of $2 million adjusted for inflation. $2 million for what would otherwise be a fairly standard sedan. By the late 70s, Chrysler's financial situation wasn't getting any better. It was about to go bankrupt. The EPA was dropping its funding, and internally the government had labeled the turbine an impractical means of powering cars. Some reports state that, somehow, Chrysler behind the scenes was solving all these problems. Emissions, MPG price, and was planning on mass-producing the 1981 New Yorker model with the turbine engine as an option. Without official confirmation, we may never know the truth, but personally, I don't believe it. The costs that were required to keep up with the missions to build factories, everything in between, just wasn't manageable by late 70s Chrysler. It is imperative that the Congress bail out Chrysler with federal loan guarantees. Both houses are debating that issue. The country cannot afford to let the Chrysler Corporation go under. The Carter administration asked Congress today to bail out the ailing Chrysler Corporation. 
Chrysler would receive a bailout from the federal government, likely due to its work on the M1 Abrams, which ironically was turbine-powered. But under the conditions of the bailout, Chrysler would need to stop spending on these outlandish research projects, namely the turbine car. Turbine-powered cars weren't gone entirely, but the hopes of mass production were. At best, these vehicles would be used to mix reception at racing circuits. By the 90s, research and development was moving towards a return of the electric car. Afterwards, you might see a turbine concept or one-off pop up here and there, no longer being a standard for the future, but more of a throwback. To some, a lot of these concepts come off as marketing stunts, but I think there were more than that. There was real work, dedication, and love for these cars that would never be. They existed in a hopeful time and place, and it's somewhat poetic that their rise was linked to the public's optimism for the future, and declined as our outlook became more cynical. And I see them as the unnecessary underdog, in a world that didn't need, but still wanted them. Conceived and built to acquire the knowledge and skill General Motors needs to give you cars designed for tomorrow.